Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we are going to continue on our series of the four pillars of marksmanship. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about firing the perfect shot. And this is going to be probably what I would think at one point, maybe the most important part up to this point, as far as you really have the potential to make this shot happen or really screw it up. And then, of course, we go on to our fourth pillar, which is follow through. So this is an important one. I hope you really enjoy it. And we'd like to ask if you enjoy the podcast, uh, share it to someone you might know that's interested in long range shooting or enjoys custom rifles and long range shooting. Uh, We really appreciate that. And it helps a lot with the show. And we'd also like to thank Krieger Barrels, a proud sponsor of the podcast here, a maker of fine cut rifle barrels out of Wisconsin. And they have their new Krieger Direct where you can go on and order a custom barrel and have it in as little as three to five days. So if you get a chance, go over to KriegerBarrels.com or KriegerDirect.com and get your barrel ordered today. So this is going to be a big one. Without further ado, here we go. So we just finished up a long range shooting school on Saturday. We have one more kicking off this week and it'll be the last for the 2021 shooting season our 2022 dates are up and we will be having a couple more dates added as time allows uh, we still limit the class to four shooters which we feel is really important for you coming in and really getting the most of three days spending here so one of the questions we get asked a lot with the shooting school is why three days and why four students? And the biggest answer I can give is we can get you about seven years experience in three days where we don't have the firing line crowded or overcrowded. We don't have chaos and we're able to really efficiently and effectively you know, teach because it's a very small class. It's a very personal class. Everybody gets to know each other really well. It's not uncommon for everybody to be sharing emails and contact information and then signing up for something else together as a group. And we like to keep it that way. And I have to be honest, I enjoy the classes a lot more in a much smaller format as well. It just makes it a great time for everybody. And it gives us a chance to teach a lot more in a smaller period of time because the class is so small We're able to get into much finer details. We're able to answer all of the questions and really efficiently cover a lot of subjects without having to cram it in. And so it just creates a great atmosphere. So if you're interested in attending our long range shooting school, classes for 2022 are filling and we're really excited to see that happening and we're looking forward to having you all here in 2022. So to continue on our series in which we were talking about the four pillars of marksmanship, and this one is called Firing the Perfect Shot. In the last couple classes, I've really been paying attention to and trying to get people's mind around how important this part is. And it really is as much as a mindset as it is an action. And it takes a little bit of explaining to go over you know, what all has to happen to make this. But really at this point, you know, we're actually done with our preparation. And so in Pillars 1 and 2, we're really getting into preparing to take the shot. You know, all of it is preparation. And of course, bad preparation or forgotten, you know, mental checks as we're getting up to this point can still screw up the shot. And so, you know, we've got all this work that we've done up to this point, but at this point, we still can't fall asleep at the wheel because we actually have to now fire the perfect shot. And it is a conscious thing. You have to be willing to mentally do it. And it actually takes a little bit of an effort. It's not something you can just willy-dilly yank the trigger and hope that the bullet's going to get down there and hit exactly where you want it to because the chances of that happening, uh, you know, people get struck by lightning every year and you know, somebody wins the lottery all the time. It, it still can happen, but for most of us normal people and for us people that have to work really hard to get good at this type of shooting, uh, luck usually doesn't fall in our favor all the time. 
So when you're getting ready to shoot and you're firing the perfect shot, a couple of things I want to start with. Number one is you've got to stop and control your breath. So at this point, think of it as about controlling your emotions and getting all of your emotions in check and just really calming down as a shooter because if we're super amped up, the odds of us cramping on the rifle or jamming on the rifle or shanking the shot, um, we've got adrenaline pumping through our veins. We're you know looking at that big game animal we've been dreaming about our whole lives. We've got to get everything in check and in line and really have to control it. That starts with your breath. You know, I always say when when you do that natural respiratory pause and you take that big deep breath in and go, and you pause, that is game on. When that breath stops, all focus is on pulling a perfect shot. And you have to get to that point to where you can take that big deep breath and let it back out. And be in a very relaxed and controlled mindset. So, for example, if you have to run to the top of a hill to get a shot at that animal just broke over the other side, you might have to take a second or two to calm down, to get everything back in and play again, to get control of yourself, both physically because you're tired and you're huffing and puffing from the, the hoofing it up over the hillside quickly, but then get your mindset around, okay, um, got to calm down, got to relax. This is this is the shot. And then you have to proceed to fire the perfect shot. So it all starts with, A, just relaxing a little bit. Once you get through your entire mental checklist, you're to the point of pausing your breath. Big, deep breath out. And then one tip I can give you here. Don't look at your crosshairs and move your crosshairs to the target. Look at the target, stare at the target of where you intend to shoot it at, and move the crosshairs to the target. And so I'm looking through the crosshairs or through the optics, but I'm focused on the point that I want to shoot. So if I'm looking at a very small concentric rings or quarter-inch dots that we put up at our 100-yard target board, I am not looking at my crosshairs and following them back and forth through finding that dot. I am actually intently looking at the dot, looking at what I intend to shoot. And then I'm bringing the crosshairs to the target. I'm bringing the crosshairs to exactly where I am looking. I am not looking at the crosshairs. The reason this is important is you have to stay super focused on where you intend on hitting the target. If you're just constantly following the crosshairs around, whether it's an offhand shot, a slung shot, a less tra- traditional type position that you're stuck in, shooting off the crook of a tree, a backpack, whatever, you're trying to chase the crosshairs that you are looking at to the target. Think about what that is doing. L- go ahead and move your head left and right and move your eyes left and right at the same time and try to look at something straight in front of your face. Try to focus. It's all in your peripheral vision. You can't focus on anything. Move your head slightly left and right, and while you're doing that, move your eyes left and right ever so slightly with it, and you can't focus on anything in front of your face. You should be like that dog that is on point, and their eyes are beadlocked on something, whether it's a squirrel hunting dog that's found a squirrel, whether it's a bird dog, or whether it's a dog that just seen something come into its yard and is about ready to go lay a butt whooping on it. I mean, that is the look. And so you're looking at the target, you're staring at exactly where you want to shoot it at this point, and you're just micromanaging your crosshairs to line up to the target itself, getting it into your vision where you want to shoot, not following it to the point of aim, if that makes sense. Once you're there and you've got your natural respiratory pause, so we're on target, we're ready to shoot, (sighs) big deep breath, this is really important. 80% of your focus should be on pulling the trigger straight to the rear. 20% should be focused on the target, making sure that the conditions aren't changing, the winds aren't changing, or the target getting ready to jump up and run away, for example, in a big game hunt. You are watching the target, and you are watching the conditions, but you are focused on that trigger pull. This is huge. Now, before you pull that trigger... 
you have to relax and just think about maintaining all of those holds and grips everywhere you're touching the rifle. So firm handshake grip, you're, you're squeezing the rear bag underneath to support the rear of the rifle. You're on the bipod, you've got the rifle either pulled into the shoulder three to five pounds or you're pushing forward into the bipod, loading it. However, all of this is set up. That position that you're in, you don't want to quote unquote freeze and lock up. You still have to be fluid with the shot. You're going to maintain all of those grips and let the rifle naturally come to the rear through all of these pressures that you're holding. You're not trying to freeze like a statue and then let the rifle come back and get you. You have to let the rifle push you and you have to move a little bit with it as it's coming through its recoil. You can't resist it. You can't fight it and you can't stop it. So you can't become an, um, a rock or an iron statue, bang, out of bronze now behind the rifle and shoot. You have to become part of the rifle, maintain those grips, but be, be relaxed in it. You know, you're going to let the rifle come naturally to the rear, bump you with your hand still holding it, with your hand still holding the rear bag with all the same pressures or grip but let it come back and fall forward without you trying to manipulate it in any way, shape, or form. Firing the perfect shot, and we'll talk about follow-through in our, in our fourth part of this series. Firing the perfect shot, when that trigger breaks, has to come straight to the rear in a line exactly with the barrel straight to your shoulder. And so when you're pulling that trigger, you want to make sure that you're pulling it perfectly flat in reference to the face of the trigger straight to the rear towards your shoulder in a line perfect with the barrel. If you picture your finger, some people struggle with this a little bit because you have multiple knuckles on your on your firing hand. So if you can grip your firing hand or you just grip your right hand if you're right handed, you know, back and forth like you're gripping a ball. And you look at your pointer finger, you'll see that as you're bending it, your first knuckle and second knuckle, and then you finally your third knuckle are pulling or falling to the rear. So they're actually bending and moving. If you struggle with this, don't pull with your first knuckle, pull with your second knuckle. So hold that finger in there nice and clear, right? Keep your finger stiff. But when you're pulling the trigger, try to pull so much not so much with your first knuckle trying to break the trigger but maybe maybe a little bit with the second knuckle as well and sometimes that gives you a little bit more control to to pull that trigger straight to the rear now i'm not saying which way is right or wrong there are people that pull with either or but for new shooters the concept is trying to break that trigger straight to the rear like a t almost to the barrel and you're trying to hypothetically pull that straight to the rear. If you're rolling that first knuckle and sometimes you get that that side torque and you're not really being able to get that because you, you're now like trying to slinky your finger, both knuckles at the same time to the rear. So for new shooters, what I'm trying to say is if you can't quite get the concept of this, go ahead, lay your, you know, roll your hand down like we talked about in the previous podcast. You know, you want to have good trigger placement. So your finger should be across the trigger shoe itself as a T. And sometimes you roll your hand, like twist your wrist to the right. If you're right-handed, twist your wrist to the left. Roll your hand down. That'll create a gap between your finger and the stock. And then your finger will actually square up to the shoe itself like a T. And then you're going to slide your finger in and out ever so slightly, like playing a violin instrument to where you find that perfect flat spot that you can pull it straight to the rear. And then a lot of times, once you get pressure on there, you can sort of, with your second knuckle, try to pull that straight to the rear. This is a technique that maybe for new shooters that haven't developed you know, any habits or bad habits, they really don't know what this is supposed to feel like. And so when they're gripping, they're sort of, they're sort of bending both at the same time. And sometimes it, they can't really get that feel to break that trigger straight to the rear. And I hope I'm making sense, you know, trying to picture what this looks like on a podcast. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes you can just roll your hand down, stick your finger in there, and sort of use the second knuckle as the main puller. Now, you're going to move your first knuckle a little bit, of course. 
but you can actually get a nice straight clean snap to the rear and maybe even a little bit more control just using your second knuckle. When that trigger breaks, it should be a clean snap. Like if you watch somebody who's a great trigger pull, and again, we're talking about firing the perfect shot. So this is a natural respiratory pause, last part of our mental checklist. We are ready to shoot. This is about you pulling the trigger. If you watch somebody who is a great trigger puller, their finger is moving just as slight as possible. It is as anti-dramatic as possible. It's not a big to-do. Their finger isn't doing a big dramatic yank. It's not bouncing off the trigger. It's not letting go when the gun fires or it's not doing that pull, 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 click, you know, and, you know, that startle type pull that some people teach from years past. The gun should go off exactly when you want it to by a straight, clean squeeze, click, squeeze, click. Just in your mind, picture, click. You're, when you're, you're just simply just move, making that final movement of like maybe an eighth of an inch with your fingers. So you can picture you're gripping something with your firing hand, right? Your fingers on the trigger. When you're pulling that trigger to the rear, it's just about a quarter inch pull. It's not a big snap. It's not a big squeeze. It's not a jerk. It's not a fast movement. It is a very clean, subtle click. And one of the best things you can do to master the perfect trigger pull is just a dry fire like crazy. So if you watch somebody who is a great trigger puller, it is as anticlimactic as possible. It is not anything to look at you're looking at it and it's a very subtle click the finger moves ever so slightly then it stays to the rear through the firing process hold that click to the back wall until the rifle is done moving and the bullet hits the target or hits the animal or you're letting go to rework the bolt so practicing pulling your trigger knowing exactly when it's supposed to go off and you make it go off when it is supposed to. No surprises. There is nothing about this process and fundamentals of marksmanship that says, well, by the way, this part should surprise you every single time. Being surprised in any of this is just means you're letting it out of your control. You're not in control. You're not taking control you're not driving the rifle. You are simply going along with it for a ride. So clean break to the rear. Nice subtle movement to snap that trigger. And then let the rifle recoil naturally. Now we're going to talk about follow through in the next podcast. It actually deserves its own podcast on its own. It does not and should not be combined with this pillar. This is the one thing that you are moving through the firing process is your finger. This is the art. This is where it's at. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the spot where you either did everything right and the bullet goes where it's supposed to or in the first two pillars, including the third pillar, something went wrong and the shot doesn't go where it's supposed to. That's really what it boils down to. So you have to be perfect up to this point or else you're going to see the errors come out. And even if you do everything perfect up to this point, you still have to pull that trigger perfectly straight to the rear in a very controlled, subtle movement that the gun fires exactly when it's supposed to without any hype or added stress or jerks, pulls, uh, any of that stuff. And then you let the rifle recoil. So what can you do to really practice the firing, the perfect shot? I think in today's age with ammunition being on the shortage and ammunition getting hard to find and, you know, people have components still. We have components. But when you go to the range, it doesn't mean you have to go and just plop on the gun and start blazing away as soon as you get there. We do this at the school quite often, and I do it quite often as well, is I make it a habit when I get on a gun, especially, you know, getting ready to shoot some different targets. I get set up on a target. I may dry fire once or twice at it before I even put the magazine in. You know, I'm trying to get that that whole process. When we talk about the four pillars of marksmanship, I'm going through all of it combined. But I'm really using that break of the trigger and I'm watching my crosshairs to making sure that I'm doing everything right. And you will be surprised that 
when you introduce any type of air into this, boy, that'll pop out in a hurry. You'll see your crosshairs move funny. I mean, just just with the fact that the when the trigger breaks, that firing pin is shaking the rifle. You know, all these little nuances or pressures that you're putting to the gun um, that aren't somewhere they're supposed to be or aren't quite right. You'll see the crosshairs sort of wiggle funny or they'll, they'll just sort of lurch up and to the left or up and to the right. And that's just you and manipulating the shot. Sometimes if you really get jammed up on something and you're really doing something wrong, it, it's, it could be a little bit more dramatic than that. But man, when you snap the trigger and all that crosshair does is just shimmer, that's a good shot. That would have been a good shot. So at this point, you're ready to go. And, you know, I even go as far as like if you're on a big game hunt, a lot of times these guides won't let you walk around with a loaded rifle uh, to each their own. You know, I'm not judging one way or the other. I'm just saying that you're walking around possibly with an empty gun. So if you get the opportunity to dry fire, let's just say the elk are out there 400 yards or 450 yards and they're just milling around. If there's not an issue where urgency becomes the key to harvesting that animal because I wouldn't forego harvesting the animal for dry firing three or four times, right? Uh, there's a big difference between firing the perfect shot and harvesting a big game animal. Sometimes you have to sacrifice some of these little things in order to harvest the animal or for expediency, right? But my gosh, if if the animal is out there just hanging out and you already are empty, I would ask the guy to say, hey, you know, do you care if I dry fire once or twice? My gosh, uh, if the guy's worth his salt, he's probably going to kiss the ground you're walking on. You know, because that that's saying a lot that you care about making a great shot. And I often find, especially in really high stressful situations, uh, whether it's in match or in hunting scenarios, sometimes just snapping that trigger once or twice quietly just takes the pressure off. You know I mean, all of a sudden, you're not so much hyper-focused on what's in front of your eyes. You're paying attention to the nuances of the rifle, the trigger breaking, all the little things that are happening back here in the bubble around the shooter, which is where all the magic happens anyway. And man, sometimes you can catch that like, ooh, that would have not been good. What was that? And then you work the bolt again and you're going through your mental checklist and you're snapping the trigger. Okay, that one feels a lot better. Now it's time to to put a live round in the gun and, and let her have it. I mean, that's just really if you have the opportunity you know, why miss it? Why give it up? Why give it away? If you have the chance to do it and it's not going to hurt or interfere with, with the opportunity that presented itself, would I drive fire once or twice? Absolutely. Not an issue at all. Varmint hunting? Why not? You know, if you're shooting at long range, like we like to shoot woodchucks here at in excess of a thousand yards when we get the opportunity to, dry firing once or twice isn't really that bad of a deal. And I promise that woodchuck has no idea that you're doing it, Right. So it's it's not a bad thing to practice. So when you're working with your rifle, when you pause your breath, you have to mentally do a shift in your thinking. You are now going from your mental checklist of preparation to firing. At this point, you are working on and trying to master that art of the perfect trigger squeeze and getting that bullet to run down that barrel and get out of there before you mess it up really is what the key is. And so when you get to the range today, try some different hand techniques. Try some different ways that you're pulling the trigger as far as like with your second knuckle. Um, try to focus that you're squared up to it and hyper focus through the barrel. Like I physically, mentally draw a line through the barrel, back to my shoulder, and in my mind, this is why I say all the time that 80% of my focus is on the trigger pull at this point and 20% is on the target. In my mind, I'm trying to pull that trigger straight in line with that barrel to my shoulder perfectly with a good, clean snap. So I hope this helps a little bit. Get out there, get a chance, dry fire like crazy, have fun. Also, be safe. Uh, we tell everybody all the time here at the school, if you're going to dry fire, make sure you do a clean sweep. So work the bolt completely. So close the bolt, lock it down, open it up. That way, if there's a live round laying in that chamber, uh, just sliding the bolt back and forth won't always pick it back up and pull it out. So make sure you stick your finger in there, look down the bore. If you're dry firing at home, safety, safety, safety is all I can say. You know, make sure you're empty. Make sure there's no ammunition anywhere to be found laying around you. Um, but again, practicing safety and being mindful that you don't want to send a round off. You know, if you're practicing at home, uh, dry firing at your in your backyard or whatever you're doing, safety first. Keep that in mind. I'd also like to take just a quick minute and thank two of our sponsors. So 
The podcast is made possible by our sponsors. Krieger is one of our great sponsors. MDT is also a great sponsor of the show, as well as Trigger Tech. MDT makes some world-class chassis. We build a lot on them. They have the new HTN26 coming out, which is their carbon fiber. We may have just gotten ours in today. I haven't opened the box up. I want to get the podcast done first, and then I'm going to go back. And if it's here, I'm going to take some pictures of it. But MDT has absolutely helped make this show possible, and we really appreciate their help. And they make a great line of chassis that include a lot of hunting chassis. So the Oryx we talk a lot about that for um, a really good budget chassis is just top of the line. I will put that up there with any $1,000 chassis and say that it will shoot just as accurate. So you get a chance to stop over to mdttac.com. That's mdttac and look at all the different chassis that they have to choose from today. We'd also like to thank Trigger Tech. You know, this particular podcast is about pulling and shooting and firing the perfect shot, right? And having a very dependable trigger that breaks at the perfect weight that you have it set for every single time means a lot in this area. And so we only use Trigger Tech in our custom rifles here because of the roller bearing system that they use and because of how clean that they break. You can put a pound and a half, two pound trigger in your hunting rifle and it breaks like glass. The other part to this with Trigger Tech that I'd like to throw out there is they offer some different shoes. So you can get the the new Pro, uh, you can get the curved, you can get the straight, you can get two stage. So sometimes just changing the shoe up, whether you want it grooved or smooth, makes a little bit of a difference as far as personal shooting goes. Some people like smooth triggers, some people like the traditional Remington 700 type curved that have the little grooves in them. And of course, they have the straight shoe, which I have to say I'm sort of getting a little fond of just because it that lever system just breaks really nice and just gives you another reference point to pulling a T for to say. So I'm really getting fond of the straight trigger that Trigger Tech has as well. So stop over to TriggerTech.com. That's TriggerTech.com and check out their full line of triggers today. So next week's podcast, we're going to continue on with this series. It's going to be the fourth pillar and the final pillar before we talk about putting the tabletop on top of the four pillars. That's the key to holding all of this together. And we're going to be talking about follow through, which is a continuation of what we're talking about here. Also, I'd like to take a quick moment to say that we have our moving target class that's going to be kicking off uh, at the end of March. We do that once a year in Swainsboro, Georgia. Registration is open and online. You're more than welcome to join us there. And just to throw out there that we are working really hard to get our reloading classes up and running. We just got our Dylan 1100 that's going to be used in the class. Uh, we do have our amp annealer and auto tricklers and different hand tools. And so all of that's coming together. We'll post some pictures up of the benches getting set up for the class. We're hoping to start them in January. Uh, so a great time to come in and learn how to reload and really get the best and most out of your rifle. So if you like the podcast and you enjoyed the show, uh, we would like to ask that you would share it. That would be awesome. We certainly do appreciate that. We'd also like to ask if you're on any of the platforms like iTunes or if you're on any of the Amazon podcasts, whatever you or however you find us. Uh, if you don't mind leaving a review for us, we certainly do appreciate it and it helps us with our standings as well. And as always, you're more than welcome to stop over to our website. Wolf Precision is home of the ace, the most advanced firearms made in the world and the most technically advanced firearm made to date so if you want a great shooting rifle a world-class rifle made like no other in the world stop over to wolfprecision.net that's wolfprecision.net and you can check those out today so thank you so much for taking the time to join us my name is jamie dotson i'm your host and you're listening to the long-range shooting and custom rifle building podcast